got the uh, got the uh, Tasters Table Club. Oh, nice bagel subscription box. So it, it was great. It just happened to work out that yesterday I got delivered your bagels, and then I'm interviewing today. Yeah, and we didn't set, we and we didn't set that up at all. So I know, incredibly convenient. Typically, yeah. before some of these things, Steph, Steph and I try to coordinate a delivery. So I'm glad this really this worked out. It was quite fortuitous. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I told Max Kunick, who uh, who's actually been on the podcast and uh, who's doing the Tasters Table Club, right? I told him I could get a bagel box delivered every week. I really <laughs> like this idea of all these little goodies and, uh, you know, the spread, you've got some drinks too. They make it a whole thing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And the bagels were, were are killer, man. I mean, I haven't got through them all. Obviously I just got them yesterday, but, uh, they're killer dude. So yeah, great job. Appreciate it. Incidentally, Max is a good friend of mine as well. We're, uh, we're tennis buddies. Um, oh, oh. there you yeah. go. There yeah. you go. Tennis buddies. I love <laughs> Yeah. How I mean, good are you at tennis? Uh, we're, we're about 4-0, if you're familiar with kind of the, how the levels go, uh, according to the rankings. So, like, you know, have some high school experience, but not, like, college level, not super serious. But we know what we're doing on the court. Okay, right on. Look at you guys. Okay, all right. I played in high school, too. I nice. was the worst player uh, imaginable, <laughs> and uh, my team hated me. Uh, I remember, uh, actually, one particular time, I always tell the story, it's kind of funny, I'm playing a, a match and my team is on the bus, heads hanging out the window, screaming at me to finish my match so that the, we, I, we can all leave to go back to school. Like nobody took me serious. I was always the last person to play worse. You know, it was like they just needed me to hit the minimum uh, to get on there. But I did it so I didn't have to run like track and off season of football. I remember that's yeah. like, it's like, okay, I'm going to play some tennis. Let me see. I didn't even know what I was doing. They hand me a racket. <laughs> I was like, let's, let's, let's give this a go. But I enjoyed the sport a lot. It's, it's yeah. really a lot of fun to play a lot of aerobics, uh, you know, hand-eye coordination, yep. uh, you know, those moments that you barely get the ball, right? Like that's what you're living for. Well, and it's also a psychological game more than anything. You, it sure. is, you, you're on an island. You know, you're yeah. the only one who controls what is happening in your outcome. And it's also zero sum. So your mess ups are your opponent's gain. Exactly. And that yes. That is where it's just yep. so hard. Yeah. And that's what you're basically doing. A lot, you know, the effort is I'm just going to keep hitting it over the net till you screw it up. Yep. You know, to, to you screw it, to you make the mistake, uh, inevitably right yeah yeah exactly it's a it is a it is a great a great game how does it compare to making bagels i'm gonna let's try this transition oh, how are we gonna connect these two yeah what, so uh i would say they're both labors of love you gotta you gotta put a lot <laughs> into <laughs> them uh to get to really reap the rewards of them but when you do it is incredibly yeah. satisfying uh there's something about the sort of exterior of tennis and sort of the way that it, it presents itself. Uh, maybe I don't think it really matches up with like what the game actually is. In the same way that the bagel has that nice exterior crust that almost disguises a chewy, doughy inside. Uh, as where tennis, you know, has a sort of country cup frufruiness to it, but it's really a pretty gritty game as we were talking about in a psychological battle. The bagels uh, are something that, that is a really complex uh, a complex food, a complex experience that that you can't just gauge from its exterior. Yeah, I like this. Bam, you did it, dude. You you found a way to <laughs> to to bring <laughs> to bring those together. I love it. Um, yes. Um, okay. Uh, well, Tom, look, th this is. I'm really excited again to talk about bagels. So you own a place called yeah. Rose. Am I saying this right? Rosen's Bagels. You nailed it. it. Yeah, That's the it. most common mispronunciation. People go rosin, like R A. Rosin. Okay, no, rosin. It is That's frozen. It. Uh, that is very southern thing to say, right? The raw. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's what we do. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, rose with an N. Rosen's bagels uh, started about three and a half years. Actually, we're almost a year four. Over three and a half. It's three point seven five, three point eight mark. Hell um, yeah, man! Right on, rock on. That's yeah. awesome. So how did this start? So it's like uh, there's no physical location, right? Of right now. That's no. not how you're that's not how you're you operate this, but which I like. This yeah. is a this is this is different. 
Yeah, and I think uh, in in kind of talking about how the company started, it explains where we are right sure. now. Sure, absolutely. And so I, I moved to Austin about seven years ago, and I was a graduate student. I was getting my PhD in sociology. I was supposed to study why people eat what they eat. I was very curious about menu decision making in particular. I'd gone to culinary school, worked in fine dining, and it was it was just always curious to me why why did X person choose to eat Y dish, sure. and and thought it'd be interesting to study it. So I got into UT sociology program under the idea that I would study that, and it turns out that I loved everything in Austin except for graduate school and <laughs> the lack of a really good bagel. So, um, <laughs> oh, so yeah, funny. I did graduate school wasn't for me, but, uh, and when I was kind of, especially having a hard time in it, a friend wanted to make some bagels. And I said, yeah, man, let's, uh, let's try some recipes out. And we, we made some bagels. Had you ever made bagels before? No, like I mentioned, went to culinary school, worked in fine dining, but baking at that point was not my. Not even else. like when you were a kid or something with grandma or so. I don't know, just some yeah. weird I experience. Mean, as I came to learn, bagels are a pretty intricate process. It's not like you can just like make them like cookies and yeah, that's good true. To go in one sitting, uh, yeah. ours, take, ours take about forty eight hours from start to finish. Wow. Including that first one that I made with my friend, it was a thirty six hour process. Uh, you barely have enough space in the home kitchen because you need to put your bagels in the refrigerator for a process called retardation. You, you shape the bagels and then it slows down the gluten development to be in a cooler environment. So we put the bagels in our home fridge, take out, take up all the space. My, <laughs> my roommates were never too happy with me. In fact, I had to buy a separate fridge. Uh, oh, so God. I could continue that my, is hilarious. my bagel trials. Uh, but yeah, so made it with that friend and fell in love with the process uh, from there. In fact, his turned out much better than mine. We did two different recipes. He at that point was like a more advanced home baker and like his were his were very good. And mine were like, eh, so, so, but <laughs> enjoying the process, having his very good, fresh homemade bagels uh, kind of was like, why am I not able to find this here? And um led to about a six to nine month process of research and development, um, which by what, that, I mean, what, let to, me let, quickly hmm. just interrupt. Like what were the bagels like that you didn't like, you know what I mean? What, what was it about them that were they like the ones you baked if, for instance, like, is that how they tasted to you or, so? And, think, and how do you know what a good bagel tastes like? Yeah, when, when right? I, like right. Where does that come from? So I think those, those are two separate questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, of I'll answer this, the second one first, um, which is I grew up in Kansas, also known as the Mecca of bagels. Uh, really? It's a joke. No, that is, oh, that's a like, complete joke. Uh, grew up on the, grew up on got the me. Yeah, Panera's <laughs> of the world were the bagels that I grew up with. <laughs> and, and so like what I thought was a bagel for most of my childhood and adolescence was the very soft, almost like just circular. Yeah. Roll. I know what you're talking about. And, and so, yeah, me too. Me too. And those are, those are like the commercial bagels that you get. Yep. You and get a I, sleeve of six or eight at the store. Sort Sarah, of thing. The Sarah yeah. Lee's, the, yeah. yeah, the St. Thomas, the, and, and like you can get the slightly improved ones at the fresh bakery of Panera. And so <laughs> I went to New York, I went to college in Nashville, but it happened that like all my friends were from New York, just out of a coincidence. And I was visiting them my, um, the summer after my freshman year. And one of my friends insisted, uh, he lived in Long Island, or his family lived in Long Island, uh, that we go to his local bagel shop in New York. It was called Long Island Bagel, bagel Company. Um, just like there's a dime a dozen for bagel shops in New York. It's like a, every corner seems to have for like sure. their own. And then yeah. of course being New Yorkers, they all have their own opinion on which corner store is the best, but he didn't mean to what he thought was, was his personal best. Um, and what I can say was hands down the best bagel that I ever had. Uh, we got a baker's dozen between three of us. Uh, I had my third, I had four and a half <laughs> bagels in that sitting. Wow. Uh, and it was oh, fantastic. Wow. And that just wow. that opened my eyes to what a bagel could be. And yeah. also just like it was a profound experience of recognizing that the idea what I had as the ideal what those Panera bagels that I had growing up were just so far off from what the actual <laughs> actual ideal of this product was. Um, and it's a complete separate category. 
But fast forward, I, I go back to, you know, living my life in Nashville, um, lived in Phoenix a little bit after college, and then moved to Austin. In all of these major American cities, you can't find a bagel like you can find a dime a dozen in the, in the Northeast. And that confused me, especially as someone who was like confused along their career route and, uh, and then just started to want to kind of make my own. So that's what I came to like, think, experience like my first really good bagel. And so to your, which helps answer, I think your first question, which is yeah. what makes a bagel bad? And I think there sure. are two, two problems that you run into with, with bagels. One is you have like just the, the more standardized or commercialized bagel. And that's a product of a process that these companies use, which instead of doing a boil and bake process, um, they use with steam injected oven, which causes, which is supposed to mimic uh, boiling yeah, as sure. it's like boiling. As it's, they're trying to do it at the same time. Yeah. Right? And yeah. It, it doesn't, re, it just quite simply doesn't result in. The of same course product. not. Of course. There's just no way. Yeah. And so what you get is on one end of the spectrum, soft circular roll. On the other end of the spectrum, I would say it's something that more closely approximates like a hockey puck. You get something that's like yeah. really hard. Uh, it's just like, it's just, they, they, individuals might be like trying to do the process of a proper bagel, but somewhere along the, yeah. along the line, they're, they're missing a few steps and bagels are made with high gluten flour. That's like part of the way that they get their chew. Might not be treating the dough correctly maybe are overboiling it could be overcooking it but there's just something that's like just it's a little too tough it's a it's a delicate balance you have to strike to get that really good bagel that is chewy yet approachably um edible frankly yeah um, and so so those are the kind of two areas where i'd say you can go wrong with the bagel and finding that sweet spot was difficult i mentioned kind of the really long r d process involved going back yeah. to new york talking to a fair amount of folks who had oh wow shops. you did do that doing you did a go of, back okay that's good that's i it, love that it was it was a nice excuse to visit said friends yeah as, well as like sure. the best form of r&d is just going to eat a bunch of bagels uh, I, I mean you know not to like play around but that's actually mm -hmm. how you do it you have yeah. to go sit down eat you know even not just Right. I'm sure you did this, not just eating, but how they presented it to you, what they gave you, you right? Like what uh, mm -hmm. sides, what this, what that, the seating, this, you probably looked at everything, never knowing what, what you're going to, you know, how far you're going to take it. So you're just sort of absorbing everything uh, as a whole, which I love. I love that. It's a great process. Uh, Precisely. That, and, and you learn what you like and dislike and how you, yeah. if once you kind of get to the stage of being able to make your own bagels or make your own product, whatever it might be, you can figure out how you're going to do your own version exactly. of Exactly, yeah. And, and you mentioned one area where uh, something that always frustrated me, even at the stalwarts in New York, is their approach to seeding, which they just frankly seed like dinguses. They're putting seeds only on one side. They're barely, barely putting any on there. So you yeah. cut the bagel open. You got half a plain bagel on one side. Other half barely has any of the seeds just because you're you're cutting it open, some are falling yeah. off. What are you your poppy seed bagel and it's now left to like three poppy seeds on it? <laughs> and so uh, I I made an ideological commitment there to the double side seed uh, at that point. And that's something we do on our bagels. Is it, and some say aggressively seed, I say it's just right. I uh, I like that and I totally understand what you're saying, right? Like when you slice it. You're getting like this weird leftover bagel piece, right? Like it, it's not, it, it's, I don't know. It's been separated from the pack almost. And you did it because you cut it in half. I love the double side seat. But yes, I mean, that's the whole point of the R&D. Not just let me taste this bagel and try to replicate it, but because it's a whole experience, right? It's a whole, it's a whole thing. And, and it's also, you know, education, uh, for the customer, if you do it right, you know, yep. and the customers appreciate that they can learn about bagels and, and this and that and appreciate your bagels. That's another level to your business. It's another way to bring them back. Right. There's just so many, you know, avenues where that works. It builds a community yep. uh, as well, which is important. Um, I think I, right? I think you're hitting on something else, too, which is tradition and history. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. So many foods uh, they're beyond so much. They're there's, there's so much more than the current moment. And yeah. I think bagels for so many folks, especially those who 
are in bagel deserts of pretty much not the tri state. Bagel area. deserts. Um, I love that. <laughs> they, they have such a strong connection. I'm that. <laughs> they have such a strong connection to the product. And, yeah, a hundred percent. Oh, bagels for sure, man. And you I, are right. Yeah. And I just think with that comes a certain responsibility to be a steward of this tradition and really do it the right way. Love that, man. What, what a great attitude to have. And that carries down into your product and the people that enjoy them. You know, I know the people that are going to listen to this, uh, you know, are going to enjoy that. He- hear that from a business owner. That- that's what you want to hear, man, that they're- they're- you're invested, you're making an investment. That way, if I invest in you, it's going to mean something. Uh, and you care about it and you care about the history and the tradition and taking it seriously, because that's also where you're going to get the best bagel from, too, is by respecting all of these things and yeah. taking them into consideration. Right. If you just like, oh, my, you know, my my neighbors think I make the best bagel. Let's open up a bagel shop. And right. You don't do it. You just went off of that, uh, which happens a lot in the food business game. I've seen it a a ton. Uh, You know, oh, uh, you know, my friend Joe says I make the best pork tacos. Let's open up a truck. You know, and you're like, whoa, whoa. You you know, same thing with that. You've got to go research. You got to find out what what's what makes, you know, what makes the people selling good bagels like how did they get there? What are they doing? Because they did the same thing when they went yeah. to start open up their business. They went and looked around 100%. and ate some other stuff and figured it out and passed on the tradition in a way. And like you said, you filter it through your own vision. And now you've got this this familiar but new thing, yeah. um, which is great. I, look, I do. You know what I want to talk about is the process of making bagels. And we've sort of pe- you sort of peppered it in there here and there, which I love because most people don't know that there are, are kind of some interesting steps in the process that just, you know, that don't cook or whatever, or maybe cook lo- wouldn't realize that that's there. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's go through like making a bagel. What what yeah. what does that entail? So it's the Rosen's bagel that is on your plate the morning it is delivered to you. Uh, was born actually 48 hours before uh, that, that entrance <laughs> into your life. Uh, so the, the birthing begins with uh, a process uh, called a sponge, uh, similar to a sourdough starter. It's a mixture of water, yeast, and flour that we then put in our refrigerator to make sure it's temperature controlled for about 24 hours. And that provides a slight subtle sour base to our ba- to our bagel. So it's the base of our bagels that provides subtle sour flavor, sorry, uh, to it. And so that sponge, uh, it also provides some of the wetness in our dough because there's a good amount of water in it. So we add that sponge then to the rest of the ingredients in our dough about 24 hours later. And the rest of our ingredients are high gluten flour, malt, salt, and yeast, and that's it. And so you have five simple ingredients, water included in there as well that you mix together and then you shape them. Uh, And that is a whole process, especially when you go from making 12 to 24 bagels for for your buddies to making where at this point averaging about 1200 bagels a day. Wow. And and figuring out how to to do that in an efficient manner. Sure. Um, And so so then you you make and shape your bagels. and as you, you shape them and you put them back in the fridge for that, I mentioned that process of retardation. Is there, is there like a quick insider trick for people listening, you know, listening or, and watching uh, mm-hmm. for shaping them? Is there some like little trick? There's always a trick to doing pasta or to doing this or, right? Yeah. There's always something. I don't know. Is there yeah, something? So the, there's two schools of thought in terms of how you create effectively what the trademark of a bagel, of course, is the, is the circular with a hole in the middle. So yeah. there's two different ways you can go about it. I don't know how many of you are watching this video or listening instead of this podcast, but if you're watching the video, you can see my hands. If you are going the first route, which is actually what I don't advise, but is what a lot of cookbooks will advise, is that you flatten dough to about four inches, a four inch circle. Then you press your thumbs up into it and then you kind of massage around it so you create a bagel. Oh. The issue we had there is that it didn't create a very round product uh, as well as one that was not very even. Um, and so, <laughs> so it, just, it didn't really hit, hit the mark for us. So instead what we do is we cut about a seven to nine inch portion. It depends on, we weigh it. So it's, it doesn't really matter what the length is. We do a five ounce Got portion it. of dough. Typically, they're between 
anywhere from five to seven inches, and then we shape it to be about five to seven inches. Uh, it can go as long as nine, as I mentioned, but somewhere in there. Uh, and then you start to roll it out, get it to the point where it's almost about a foot. You wrap it around your hand, and then you, you do one quick motion, like so. And then that is what... Oh, uh, that is, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That we're good. That's the clip right there. That's it's a, slick. That's it's slick. a little more, it's a little more intricate uh, and you don't want to over roll it. That can cause the, yeah. the dough to get a little too hard. Like we mentioned on those bagels that taste like hockey. Bars. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. So that's so what I over roll. Just one quick roll. Um, and, and that is how you do it. I would say it takes about similar to juggling. You know, if you dedicate one day yeah. of your life to rolling bagels, <laughs> you can roll bagels for the rest of your life, but it's going to take a lot of work in that one day. Sure. To get used to that, you know, to get it all, I get it, but you do it a few times, but that's great, man. That, what a great insider tip. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yep. Okay. Didn't, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, no, process. you're good. Okay. So, okay. so now you have about another 24 hours, your bagels are going to go in the fridge and that's that process of retardation. So that slows down the gluten development in your dough. So if you, if you don't do this, um, your bagels will first overproof because there's yeast in there. It's just going to go crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In addition, uh, your, your glute, it, it won't, it'll kind of overdevelop and get a little too hard as well. So uh, one other thing that allowing putting your bagels in the fridge does, it allows them to withstand the boil, which is the step you do right before they bake. So now we're at about, let's say hour 40 or so. Is in, it because it's changing life. the temperature? Is that why you say that? It cools it? Yeah, cools it down is that, is that, and allows, okay. yeah. Because if it were just say at room temperature or what some places do is they put them in a proofer. Uh, when you do that, they get incredibly soft. And then when you put them in your water that you boil them in, uh, they just spread all around and they can't I, really I see. it. I see. Okay. Yeah, so, that makes sense. So it allows them to uh, just get the toughness to go into the water. Yeah. Uh, and so in hour 40 of the bagel's life, uh, they're going to be boiled. And so the boiling of the bagel is what gives. This is the uh, step here, guys. This right? Is, like this is, this is the for, one that some people one. skip. This is a big step, right? I read about yeah. that. Like people skip this step. This is a big step. And this, this is what makes it. A little bit different from other stuff you know you bake right like it, what what other things are you boiling before yeah, it's borrowed from the pretzel making tradition and that's frankly yeah. the only other product yeah. i know of as yeah. well yeah and yeah. and so the it, it what it helps is get that distinct crust on the exterior layer of your bagel as well as a, a yet another element that adds to that really you know, distinct chew that you get with a bagel comes from, from the boil. So those are the two things that you get with it. During the R&D process, the biggest breakthrough I had was altering our water to make it more basic, like along the pH scale. For ah, about the longest period of time, I felt like I had a B plus bagel. Like friends would, they would like it, but not, they didn't have that love reaction. That, that, that wow before. factor, right? Wow that factor. wow. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And then we altered our bagels to make them the sorry altered our water to make it more basic. And once that happened, that was that was when the shift happened. And that was nice. when I got the wow factor from folks. And that's when I had the confidence to start to think like, hey, maybe this this uh, business idea has some legs. Um, and so you you got to alter your water. And uh, we use sodium hydroxide, also known as lye. It's food safe, all good. Um, you got to you got to handle it with, with care with gloves and goggles sure but after sure. you do that um uh, and you the water is boiling it's all good and that's how we alter our water it's about we it's about 14 grams per 5000 grams of water so it's a trace amount just yeah. a little bit gets you what you need and yeah. and that really small amount um is what's really key to making the bagel i'd say that everything is important that was like the one that really elevated wow. the bagels. Wow. That is crazy. That's cool though. That's, yep. that's cooking, right? That's so, baking, cooking yeah. science. Love it. And so then the next step you got after your bagels have had their about 30 seconds on each side in their boiling water, you take them out and this, this is when you seed. This is when you do the double side. So you, you want to get like your tray out of your seeds and, uh, and whatever you're chopping you might be using. Yeah. Say it's your, your sesame seeds. Get a tray out of sesame seeds. One side, flip it, get it on the other side, put it on the tray that you're going to bake it in. And then the final step is you bake. Um, bake the bagels and then you take them out and then you got your fresh bagel. And that is the 
That's about the 48 hour life cycle. Bam. Of a fresh baked bagel. So basically once it's in the oven, that's like your, that's home stretch, right? Yeah. That's coming down third for home plate really yeah. at that, at that point. That's the last, you know what it, is? it sounds like, excuse me, <coughs> not a COVID cough, uh, guys. Um, it, it sounds like a, just like a, I mean, just to compare, it sounds like you're just doing a quick, you know, fry, if you will, a quick fry and then in the finish off in the oven, right? It's, it's sort of the same product, but it's boiling water, right? You're just it, doing it's a, a little quick. bit of a two step. I would yeah. say, and honestly, we use a spider, which, uh, which is a cooking device that is yeah. common in frying, um, yep. to retrieve our bagels. Yeah, and flip them sure. In there. Scoop them out. So, yeah, yeah. No, it's an, I hadn't really thought of the boil in water as, as similar to frying, but in the same way that frying leads to, you know, that nice crunchy exterior. And all the products exactly. Are, yeah. It's, it just gives it that to quick exterior. boom, boom, you know, and then you finish it off somewhere up right in the oven mm -hmm. or whatever. That's a quick thing, right? When you do a steak, you, you sear it on both sides and get it in the oven, right? It, so it's mm -hmm. probably, do, it's doing something to the outer part of, yep. of that dough to then, well, that, you know, bake it. This is something I hadn't like thought so. about, but like, as you mentioned, the sear, you get the Maillard reaction on your steak. Yeah, exactly. Thinking, thinking of uh, bagels with their own Maillard reaction is fascinating. I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think right? about that one. Yeah. Hey, bam. See, this is what we do here. We have the, this is what podcasts are for to break this down even more and just spitball. And, you know, I love talking about this stuff, man. This is like, uh, this is my favorite stuff. You know, I remember having the food truck, um, you know, and being in a food park for the mm -hmm. first couple of years of having the food truck, because, you know, if you have a food truck or food truck or trailer and you're out there and you're by yourself and you're doing this, it is great. Don't get me wrong. And you do have certain events, of it, but when you're in a food park, there's this community and you're constantly talking about shit like this every day. You're constantly sitting down and having these conversations, you know, in between this, that, and the other. And I kind of miss that, to be honest with you, I miss these uh, sort sort of thing. So it's great to yeah. you know have this podcast and and have someone like yourself on and be able to have uh, these conversations. Because in the person listening, these are great, cool conversations. Yeah. They're not going to a have themselves, you know, right, right, or or so. What, yeah. One it. thing I'm curious about in the food park culture: how many trades went down on a nightly basis between the trucks for the various <laughs> foods? I, I just love the barter system in in the hospitality community. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every day. That's an everyday occurrence, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, shout out uh, Beirut with my shishtawuk is what mm -hmm. I got. That that was my trade or shawarma. I switched it off. I was pretty militant with that or from pretty Thai, i would get their pad thai nice uh, shout out to robert and Kristen. uh we had Gemma; she did jamaican food so i would get whatever she was mystery plate uh that she was handing out uh we had uh let's see vegan kitchen uh so i would get some vegan food a little you know swap there and then we had a couple spots that were always turning over so yeah. i didn't if you know I always waited a little bit to get food from a truck. This is a little, I don't know if I should be some, I'm just, fuck it. I'm yeah. being, I'm going to be honest, but yeah, I would always wait like a month to yeah, see yeah. Uh, if they stick around. They? Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Let, let me make sure because look, I know what happens in food trucks. Okay. They, yeah. people cut corner. I mean, just, I know what happens in food. So, you know, I won't just eat anywhere. I will try some stuff, but if I see some red flags, ain't happening and how uh, there's a few red flags i know to look for and you what know are, what are your red flags i'd be curious about that what what are the Cle cleanliness is a yeah. big big thing not necessarily the cleanliness you're looking at which is the top of the table mm -hmm. the chair maybe the counter mm -hmm. i'm looking at corners I'm looking yeah. at the top ceilings dust what the thing you know the top of picture frames the things right like the the top of a counter for instance where tickets go the fucking vent hood dude that's yeah, a that's vent a, hood, that's a vent hood's a clear right? marker that's a clear marker you can see from eye level i don't need to i can see it from back in an open kitchen right like i may not be able to see your grill or your flat top or right how you're handling grease or the floors uh but there are certain things right you can just tell fr from a certain instant now that's not always a sign that you know you know, you got to be there, right? You, you got to be, but that's definitely cleanliness is a big, big thing. And again, for those little things that, you know, that I'm looking at to make sure and hole in the wall, when people say hole in the wall, 
So that's a misconception. People think hole in the wall. OK, everything's going to be dirty, but the food somehow magically going to be good. No, that's not a hole in the wall. A hole in the wall is it could. Yeah, maybe it's this weird little small space and a couple of chairs, but things are clean where they need to be. And they, right, like it may be old or this or that. That's not dirty. That's different, right? If you're walking into a dirty ass place because it's a hole in the wall, but I promise it doesn't mean the food's going to be, it's probably not going to be good. That's why it's literally a fucking hole in the wall. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what I'm, I don't know. What do you look for? What do you, uh, what, what sort of, th- you know, in a line, right? People, yeah. people are eating there. People are eating there. I, I mean, this is hard. You can't really judge this until you've already made the commitment to ordering. But when I order, seeing how they handle it and kind of the sure. process behind it uh, sure. shows kind of what, what has gone into how, what systems are involved in terms of how they're going to get my order to my plate uh, that I find to be really important. And also like, especially if it's like a little bit busy, I think we've all been there when you're in the weeds and you yeah. kind of just tell that someone is like, just a little hose that night. Uh, <laughs> I, that's where you also kind of know, like they're not probably properly staffed. They're not sure. where they need to be. Um, those are certain things that while I say they're red flags, I also have a lot of empathy for because again, you know, you, you, been you, there, all been there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Love all that. Yeah. I can totally. Yeah. The thing about the ordering is a great point. Uh, that's very insightful uh, because that's honestly the way that they handle that is the way they're going to make your food. Yep. Right. They, if processes, right. The, the re, a, a food play is all about processes. So, you know, the ordering process, the seating process, the cooking process, the prep process, everything's about steps and, and minimizing the number of steps to get to right. What you want to happen. So um, yeah, that's a great point, man. If that's because that's the same process they're going to use to make your food. That's the same process they use to to come up with the food they're going to give you. Right. The the amount of thought that goes into it. So, yeah, those are all, um, you know, yeah, those are all great signs uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See, I love talking this stuff. This is like yeah. this is fun. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, it happens. Look, you, you're going to. Yeah, right. It, it, no, again, I, I, especially on the it happens. side. Uh, yeah, for sure. That that can happen at a food truck. I've been there for sure where I mean, that's happened to us lots of times at Container Bar where we would be so overrun because it's late. The, the, a lot of drunk people want food and you're, you're getting hit from all sides and, and you're doing your best. You might be cutting a few corners, but you can tell when people are fast, the corners they're cutting aren't really anything you know, damaging, for instance, like they may not give you the proper greeting or, you know, look in the eyes and the full spiel that you would normally get. But they're not cutting the corner of how the payment, making sure they got your name right. Your order was correct that they got right, right. The payment mm-hmm. and and making sure you know how to get your order, for instance, that that sort of thing. So that still runs properly. Yeah. I mean, you see a place at its best when they're in the weeds. That's exactly. how you and know. I, was gonna say, I would say honesty too about the weight. There's Great nothing call. worse than yes. the 15 minute wait that you know with your eyes this is 45 to an hour. Yes. <laughs> like Good call. Just, yes. Which I think yes. happens mostly at trucks because it's just like a volume thing. Like it can't handle the 12 you know what it is? they have. Yeah. You know what it is? It's like my employees used to tell me this. Because I would say that I'm so glad you brought that up, man. That is such a great point. And honestly, when you're early in the industry, you do this because you don't want to disappoint people. Mm-hmm. That's where it comes from. They feel that they'll disappoint you if they tell you 45 minutes. And so they say 15. But really, like you said, it's going to be 45 or more. So, you know, this is what I would tell them. Look, I promise you, just be honest with them. Get it out of the way. They're not going to write they. they because look to you, a minute is a minute, right? But to a customer, a minute is five minutes and five minutes is 10 minutes and 10 minutes is 20 minutes. So you've just exponentially made it worse by, you know, setting a expectation wrong from the beginning, just set the expectations right from the beginning. People will wait for good food. I would always tell that to people too. don't just send out shit to get it out quick to people because you're worried about the wait time. Uh, you know, people will, you know, they will not come back w- for bad food. 
They will come back if the weight's a little this, that, but the food was good. You know, you made a mistake one time and you fixed it, but never screw up the food. That, that is, you know, you, you're not going to recover from that, but you can recover from the other thing, right? So yeah, setting that expectation right, never sacrificing on food, even if you have to make them weigh double, you know, give it to them for free, whatever you got to do, but don't give them bad food just to meet that ticket time, right? Because the moment they open the food, you'd lost. You, you, all you did was gain that quick high of, oh, my food's ready. But as soon as they get the food, yeah. right, it's not what they expect. Yeah, I think, I think there's like a, you're conditioned to really like putting the ticket, whatever, how, wherever you put the ticket, stab the ticket. The, yeah. The, the, the ticket stacker is yeah. that feels nice. That sure. feels nice Pulling the mind. ticket down and stabbing it. Yeah. You're right. You're but right. hundred you percent. I mean, it should obviously never interfere with, with the end product, but, but I do think there's something there. Yeah, but, uh, no, you're right. You're right. This has also been front of mind for me right now uh, because we're looking at a brick and mortar pretty seriously. I'm, I'm knocking on really me. nothing okay. signed, but it's like almost to the signing phase, um, and it has a drive through component. And and uh, like yeah. I've been drive through is amazing, but it's a double edged sword because of this exact issue where when folks are in drive through, they're expecting it within five five minutes is a long wait there. Yeah. And, and what I'm like seriously considering is how do you make high quality food in such a condensed period of time like that? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, it's, it's something I, I don't have the answer to yet. I'm, I'm working on solving it <laughs> pretty, I'll, pretty t- I'll tell you where but. you go. I mean, look, not to, you know, people have certain feelings about the place I'm going to mention, but whatever they rock drive through, like, like nobody's business. They are the number one drive through the handling of, they handle drive through the bet. Chick fil A. Let's be real. They know how to handle drive through like nobody's business. Yeah. Now, how, how and what's I don't know, but there's definitely systems they have that other people don't that they're able to handle the volume like you don't believe. Another place is P. Terry's. They yeah. do a great job with handling volume. Um, you know, I get what you're saying. That, that's what it's about. It's about yeah, it's- being able to handle that volume in a, in a great way. Right. And when really the machine's going, you you're rocking you can handle tickets right you're like dude we're we're rolling we yeah. got that momentum you know that that's where it's at so yeah for sure yep so that's uh that's been in front of mind right now is ticket time and how to decrease it and so uh especially because we have up until this point uh our ticket time is you know 24 to 48 hours people place their order for delivery and then we yeah. bring it to their homes and yeah. so it's a whole different ball game uh, when it's when it's instantaneous. And so. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the next phase. And we'll that's see. awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, wow. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's not this one, I'm sure it, it's in your mind. It's something you guys mm-hmm. do want to uh, expand to. So, yeah, I love that. That's that's so super cool. Are you thinking about making it sort of like the bagel shops you used to walk into in New York? Yeah, precisely. Um, and so kind of walk in, you have that enormous deli counter full of cream cheese, other deli salads, a um, bunch of bagels right behind the counter that you can see, have your eyes into the kitchen, you can see a little bit of the process. Um, that That is the goal for kind of the, the interior front of house space. And then with us being in Texas, want to have a good patio for people that experience their bagels on the outside, or if they're in the grab and go mood, that drive through. So uh, wanted to be the one stop shop for all the bagel needs. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure that's going to happen. So I'll, I'll be first in line, man. First in the drive through to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to get something. Well, you know, it sounds like, um, yeah, that sounds awesome, man. You know, I definitely think the process of seeing the bagels be amazing is a big, when it's something interesting, like, Mm-hmm. that y'all do and how seriously you take it and the in that you respect it all and everything like that's a that's a cool thing like right like when you go to a place and you see the easy tiger right for instance or when you're in europe man they do that a lot the windows you can see them making the pasta you see the guy doing the thing or whatever it is you, that's what you're you almost go there for that reason alone and like, before right? they before they over expanded crispy cream was always crispy, a, a, yeah. fun, a fun place yeah. to see that you know yeah, it's, when you feel more a part of the process but just by just by seeing it and sure. so so that's yeah. a goal um yeah um, as much more, as it can be right that, that you can exactly. make that possible yeah yeah for sure no i love that man that's awesome 
That's so cool. Well, look, is there anything um, we didn't talk about that you wanted to discuss? Uh, I don't, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, I definitely know. want you to plug everything at the yeah. end here. I mean, through the duration of the pandemic, we're offering free home delivery. That's been a big thing for us. Uh, even before the pandemic, we were doing home delivery, but it was at about like, I don't know, one or two a day. And now we're up to, you know, double digits per day. Uh, That's of awesome. home deliveries, which is awesome. And yep. um, just want Austin to know that uh, we can definitely fulfill your bagel needs. Um, you can stay safe while you do it. Uh, and just just in general, just a quick sidebar, the pandemic's been absolutely bonkers uh, and crazy sure. to be absolutely. operating a business during it. But yep. um, we also, uh, it also kind of forces us to pivot and think about some things. So you can also find our bagels at every Whole Foods in the greater Austin area. Um, Hell yeah. We deliver them fresh daily. So uh, either deliver to your home through rosensbagels.com or you can go to Whole Foods and uh, be on the lookout for a brick and mortar. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I would say my target right now is the spring, which probably means the summer. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I know how that stuff works for sure. Um, is this is this Austin proper that that all of Rosen's available? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a pretty broad, we, we deliver to about 20 different uh, coffee shops every day. So, so our delivery drivers are on the road by 5 a.m. We got two of them. And uh, any and plans to go to day. any other cities? Not yet. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, I think that's when a lot of food businesses start to lose their, if not food quality, at least like a little bit of the magic that makes them special is, sure. is when, you, when you start to overexpand. And so I see. at yeah, least I for me, it. that's not the goal uh, in, in starting this business and in making bagels is to just have a bunch of rosins. Um, part of it is like, you know, the, the, or, the reason behind the company was to fill an Austin specific need. And so for now, that's, that's my goal. Let me ask you this. What mm -hmm. if you started doing delivery out of Austin? So you're still yeah. making them here. You're still doing that, but maybe delivery. Cause look, we're moving the studio to Dallas in okay. a little, in a little bit, you know, that's why I asked. I'm like, I want to get some Rosen bagel in okay. Dallas. So you the know. solution for that problem, uh, and is another thing that was uh, a pandemic pivot, is we have a product called Frozen's F R O S E N, um, and they well, these bagels follow the exact same process as all of our bagels, with the exception. So after they're boiled and seeded, they don't go in the oven. We put them right in the freezer, and then they're frozen, and then they are ready to be baked at home. And so we've been delivering those and they're also available for delivery. That's now. awesome. So folks can have a fresh bagel whenever they want it. And I think that's going to be the way that we get outside of Austin. Yes, that's a great idea, man. Plus, you're involved in the process. It's like a pizza, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to get a frozen pizza yep. and cook it at home. And, and what look, people what always, argue, always have one frozen pizza in their freezer it's true. at all times. And what it, and I will vouch for these and say, unlike the pizza or the burrito in your freezer, this actually, because we have, this isn't something that's been cooked before and then you are reheating it. Yeah, most, I see what you're most saying. Most products are. This has yep, never been yep. baked. It's parboiled, not par cooked. And yep. so you are going to get a first never before baked bagel out of your home oven. If it's an everything bagel, your whole house is going to smell like an everything bagel. That's oh, great. man. That's a great idea, man. I love that. Well, then that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to be doing is getting that uh, up there. Yeah. And for the people, look, this this podcast is, it, I mean, obviously it goes out everywhere, but it's the Lone Star Plate. So it's all of Texas. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure all Texans uh, can get uh, these bagel. That's a great. I love that, man. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's going to be the way I go for sure. Uh uh, for the bagels. Uh, are there any good places in Dallas to get a bagel? I guess I'm about to find out. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I don't, I don't know the Dallas bagel scene very well. A few friends who have moved there have lamented it. Um, oh, Houston, really? I yeah, I know Houston has a few local shops that, that are pretty good. Um, but but yeah, that's that's the extent that I Damn. know. The, the broader Dang, Texas right. bagel scene. So well, I think you're going to need some Frozens, my friend. That's it. That's it, brother. Plus, that's way better. I'm at home, right? I can, yep. uh, you know, do it that way. Yeah, that's that's the way to go. Well, man, this is this is. Oh, okay. Before we go here, uh, let's tell people your, you know, website, social media stuff. Yep. 
you know, that, that sort of stuff. Let's play. Yeah. All social media handles are at Rosen's bagel co. Uh, you can get some fun bagel content every day. We do a fair amount of giveaways too. That's something that's also just in the organizational ethos is wanting to hook our customers up. Um, so, so check out at Rosen's bagel co on Instagram, uh, and Facebook and then rosensbagels.com, uh, is our website. You can find out more information about our process, the history of the company. And then of course, most importantly, uh, order your bagels uh, and you can get them delivered to your home um, within 48 hours of your order. So uh, we, we love doing it. And uh, also just if, assuming we got our customers listening, thank you. Um, like I mentioned, it's been a surreal past 10 or so months and uh, it just to still be operating a business um, would not be possible without the support of the greater Austin community, which has just been uh, fantastic. So thank you. That's awesome, man. No, for sure. Absolutely. Well, listen, man, this has been absolutely uh, great. I really appreciate this, man. This has been awesome. Um, I've learned a lot uh, myself, so I know people are going to learn as well. That's just how that goes. So, um, yeah, this has been great, man. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you for coming on and just explaining all this to us. And yeah, please, guys, check out uh, the website, follow them on social media, get these bagels if you can't make it get the frozen ones and boom, you can feel like you're making bagels at home and impress your friends. And, uh, <laughs> right. I love it, man. That's, that's so cool. And you know what we didn't get into, uh, which I'll do in, in the intro later, man, is the history of the bagel. I forgot mm -hmm. to totally bring like, where did bagels come from? Or do you want to tell us real quick? Uh, where, the, where did they come from? There, there's been a book written about the bagel. Uh, what is it? It's a, like a modest history or like a, a surprising history of a modest product. Um, and so its origins are actually a little confused. People believe that it came from Poland, derived from an Italian, uh, kind of mimicking an Italian product, Italian bread product that was also boiled uh, before it was baked. Um, and some think uh, the, the reason why there's a hole, although this is disputed, is because early, early uh, peddlers of the bagels would put them on a stick to then just be able to, to hand out. Uh, made its way to America around the 1890s um, through European immigrants and uh, who settled in New York City. Um, strong labor history. Um, the, there was a strong baker's, uh, bagel, baker's union led by bagel owners in New York City during during that time, um, which as as someone who's who's progressive in their politics is means a lot to me. And so uh sure. so yeah, that uh that's a quick, quick and dirty of it. Yeah. But there's there's a lot there. Um but yeah, check out it's Maria, I'm forgetting her last name. Uh it's a it's a fun, fun book on the history of the bagel. Uh, so. No, that's cool. Uh, Cause you know, some, you're right. I mean, one day somebody was like, I, I'm, I'm going to make a bagel. Uh, they didn't call it a bagel, right? The first day they, they're like, let's do, I'm going to do this, that somebody will probably never know, right? The true exact, uh, cause I tried to read online, but you're right. There was a few different stories. Um, yeah. so, someone from Vienna supposedly had made it for a King or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the first, I, but then I read something else and then you said something and it's just like, oh man, I don't. Yeah. Mar Maria suggests Poland, but it could. Yeah. And she, she mentions the story too, for the, the Austrian King. Uh, it's yeah. all, it's all, who knows? It's, cr you know, it's crazy. Bit, but, yeah. It's more mysterious. It's almost better that it stays a little mysterious, you know, that, that you kind of get to derive your own, uh, story of the bagel but i love the stick idea that they had it i never heard that they had it on sticks to be able to hand out that makes a lot of sense to be yeah. frank with you that that makes a lot of sense and to be able well i guess not at, before it was cooked they wouldn't have it on the stick that it, i was like oh that's how they would get yeah. them in the oven but i was like oh they'd be drooping that wouldn't make any <laughs> sense right <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but after they're cooked i can totally see them walking down the dirt mud road whatever and handing out uh bagels like that yeah that's uh that's definitely interesting well man definitely uh thank you so much for that quick little <laughs> that's yeah, a great way to end it uh for sure so thank you so much tom really appreciate it man uh enjoy the rest of your day and uh yeah man thank you so much for sharing so much about bagels dude this was awesome back at you thank you so much for having me on the lone star play podcast is produced by texas real food go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, 
artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Oh, 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 o